and welcome to the SheClix webinar about printer profiling. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of SheClix. Before we get started, we have a word from our sponsor. This webinar is sponsored by Permajet, a multi award winning brand committed to providing the best fine art and digital photo paper and canvas media. 19 years of extensive technical inkjet knowledge and their advanced free ICC profiling services are all provided to help amateurs and professionals alike produce that all important perfect print for business or for pleasure. For more information, visit permajet.com. So thank you very much to Permajet. So today's webinar is presented by Louise Hill, who is a very experienced photographer and uh, she shoots in a range of, range of genres and who knows just about everything that's worth knowing about printing. So hi, Louise, how are you? Yes, hello, yes, good evening, Angela. It's lovely to be back with you all. Thank you, yes, it's great to see you again. Now, if anyone hasn't seen the first webinar that Louise did, you can actually see it on uh, our website and also on our YouTube channel. So um, do make sure you catch up on that. And that was all about selecting the right paper for your printer and you know matching your image to the paper. But tonight it's all about profiling a printer which is a really important step and can make a massive difference to the results isn't that right it certainly can yes we're not only going to be talking about uh, profiling the papers we're also going to be starting right at the start of the uh, procedure really and that's for calibrating your monitor and the Fantastic. reason why it's important yeah okay well louise if you want to take the floor over to you okay i'm just going to share my screen Right, well, good evening, everybody. And as I said, it's lovely to be back with you all. And um, hopefully that uh, most of you attended the first one. And uh, now this second part is the most important part of calibration and profiling your papers. So off we go. What we're going to be covering this evening is really our Permajet's recipe. And what we're going to cover tonight is the basics of color management, why and how to calibrate your monitor, the difference between a generic or a custom ICC profile, how to print a custom profiling chart, correct Photoshop and printer driver settings, and then installing profiles on a Mac and a PC. The aim of this presentation is to enable you to closely match the colors on your monitor with the colors of your print. So questions that we actually get asked very regularly is why do my prints not match my monitor? So you're actually seeing the image on the left on the monitor and then the print comes out and it's all wishy-washy. So they can look great on the monitor, but don't exactly print the same way. So you may try editing colors and reprinting to get what you see on the screen. But is what you are doing actually correct? Should we really be asking, why does my monitor not match my print? Color spaces on a monitor uses light to create colors and can display in excess of 16 million colors. Whereas ink, CMY UK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and uh, cyan, and paper can produce approximately 160,000 distinct colors. Remember that you can't print light, so prints will always appear darker. The color management chain is obviously from when you actually take the image in the first place uh, to actually the monitor you are using, to the paper type you are using, to the actual printer, and then we have to profile to see the final output. So do I really need to use color management, you might ask? Have you convinced yourself that you can solve your color problems by an eye alone? But can you really trust your eyes? Now, what numbers can you see on uh, these two squares here? It's quite plainly that you can actually see the eight on the right hand side, but the five is actually uh, quite hidden away behind all the uh, magenta and the yellow. So it's not actually clear. Now we say here two colored squares and we say, well, what colors can you see? Are they both red? They're actually orange and purple. So interesting. What color are these two squares? Now looking at the two squares, the one on the left, it looks like a blue and the one on the right looks like a yellow. The human eye can be so easily fooled and they are both gray. 
Measuring and control your devices, editing by eye is not actually the best way. The human eye is the original RGB device. 10% of men and only 0.5% of women have problems with color vision. It has to be the men. Be aware that cataracts and contact lenses can affect how a person perceives color. So remember that it can actually put a different hue in front of your actual eye lens and that is actually going to cause an issue when you're viewing colors. So you need to implement some form of color management. Color darkroom users have been doing this for years by using color analyzers. Those people who used to be darkroom workers remembers being in the darkroom and using the old big color analyzers and actually changing the colors, the, the reds, the magentas, the cyans, et cetera, to actually get the color tones correct. But now we don't have that option, which is why we have to think about calibration. Ideally, capture your image in a raw format for conversion. This has no compression or loss of data. Import the file into your imaging software using a raw converter. And we always recommend that you actually select Adobe 1998 as the destination color space, as this provides more data for print purposes. And you'll actually see the image just actually at the bottom, but you'll actually see the Adobe RGB is the actual third triangle in the, uh, in the main triangle. Now that gives you ample color space in order to actually produce a good high quality color image. You don't really need to go to the Pro Photo RGB. That really is aimed at labs and um, people who are actually selling their work and using large format space or, or large capacity cameras. The more information you can import will help the print process. Now, does your monitor matter? Well, yes, it does, because it's actually the preview of your actually printed image. Mod monitors are LED backlit, and you can actually get different types of panel depending upon how old your uh, monitor is. The older versions used to be twisted pneumatic or vertical alignment, which actually means that when you actually were viewing your monitor from a side, you would actually get a color shift. So if you're facing your monitor face on, it would be one color. And if you move to the side, it would actually be another color. So therefore it wasn't actually um, consistent. Then they actually brought out the monitors with in-plane switching. This is the best color for monitors and for photography and for viewing angles. Mac products are typically IPS. All monitors show colors in RGB color space and the monitor workspace is typically sRGB, but the top of the range is Adobe RGB. 4K and 5K or retina refers to the DPI or resolution of the actual screen. So the power of your screen. The, set, the daylight setting that you should use really is 6,500, which is actually daylight. So that is why you should always work within a, a daylight situation um, when you're actually viewing your prints after you've actually printed them out. If it's a nice clear day, not sunny day, but a nice bright day, you can actually view your images outside and it will actually tell you and give you the correct color on your image. So you can actually get um, daylight lamps that actually sit by the side of you that you can actually just lift up and just check your print after you've printed it. So how does it all work? To color manage a device, you have to measure it as no two devices will reproduce color in the same way. To measure your monitor, you have to attach a monitor calibrator and run some software. To measure a printer, you print a test patch and use a measurement device to measure the color. We always recommend that you calibrate your monitor regularly. There are certain things that we ask you to consider when calibrating. First is allow about 30 minutes for your actual monitor to warm up. Clean the screen. How many screens do we actually have? There, there's finger marks all over the screens. I know mine is. So just clean the screen so it's nice and, uh, and clean. Reduce the brightness level to approximately 100 to 120 candela because the calibration device will actually monitor the brightness level for you. Mac screens are typically brighter than PCs. 
Also consider the position of the monitor in the room. If it's actually by a window, remember that the actual window light is actually going to come in and alter the color screen that you're actually viewing. So your eyes are going to be um, adjusting to the actual light that's shown onto the screen. Don't work in a really bright orange room or a bright yellow room. Try and work if you can in a neutral colored room, just to make sure that you're actually working in a neutral space. Check the ambient light. And as I said, it can affect the image on the screen. Too bright, less image contrast on the screen. So you could be actually manipulating an image and it's not actually showing you the true um, colors on actually on the image that you want to manipulate and process. Will it go out of calibration once you've actually calibrated your monitor? It can do. If for example, you have a Windows update or a Mac update for a, a instance, it can actually throw the calibration out. So in order to actually just keep it in check, we always advise that you actually just calibrate about once a month, just to keep it in check. Once you actually set the calibration device onto your monitor, as shown on the uh, right hand image there with the laptop, with the actual monitor calibration device situated on the front of the screen, you can actually set a, re a, rem um, a reminder for you. And this will actually just come up as a prompt that will actually just tell you just to actually calibrate your monitor again. We always recommend using a data color spider or an X-ray device. We find that these are the most consistent and give you the best quality for your money. Prices start from round about 120 pounds, including VAT. Once you've actually calibrated your monitor, the actual monitor profile, every time you actually start your monitor, or your computer will automatically click into the up-to-date profile. Color management software makes an output in RGB values and the software then measures the actual colors which is produced by your device using an optical measuring instrument. This data is then compared with the known information and the difference between the two pieces of data is saved as an ICC profile. That stands for International Color Consortium. An ICC profile describes how a device or working space must reproduce the colors. Using an ICC profile ensures color accuracy when sending an image from your software application, i.e. Photoshop or Lightroom, to the printer, telling it exactly how to recreate the colors in your digital file. There are two options available on an ICC profile. You can have a generic profile or a custom ICC profile. A printer profile is made for the combination of your printer, the ink you are using, and the paper type of your choice. If you change any one of these factors, the profile will not be accurate. So first of all, when you're starting, you consider, do I use a generic or a custom printer profiles? And you'll understand a bit more about those a little later on. Always before you actually start printing, ensure you have a complete nozzle check pattern. Make sure it's part of your actual workflow on your printing. This actually saves time and money because if you don't actually just print a nozzle check out, which is part of the maintenance of the printer, and you're missing some of the colors, you could be wasting paper and paper costs money. So always just print a quick nozzle check just to check that your printer is firing correctly. Also check the print head alignment. Now the print, the print head alignment can come out of kilter, particularly if you're using heavier, thicker papers. Nine times out of 10, you'll actually see lines going across your image. These are usually um, horizontal lines going across the image all the way down the page. And there are very fine lines going all the way down. So if you actually see that kind of banding, as we call it, on your image. Then you go to your maintenance tag on your printer in the utilities and actually run a print head alignment. And then you can actually bring it back into the kilter. Print the target patch using the Adobe Color Print Utility, which is what I'm going to be showing you in a moment. Always use a large letter stamp when sending it in to us. And we use a profiling device and software 
which we will run your patch through and email it back to you. Install the profile on your system and we select the profile when printing. An ICC profile generic is a profile which has already been created by using a third party's printer. Now, although this is not 100% accurate, this is a great starting point if you haven't used profiles before. We as Permajet offer a wide range of generic profiles for most photo printer models and using original OEM inks, which is the manufacturer's inks, or our own Permajet's EcoFlow inks. So on visiting the Permajet website on the ICC profiling page, you'll actually see that we download the generic ICC profiles. Now these are free to download and all you need to do is install them on your computer and use them in your chosen application, such as Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, Aperture, QI Image, etc., on a Mac or a PC. All you need to do is simply select your printer, and in this case, I've chosen the Canon Pro 300. Cho choose your ink type. So are you using an OEM or are you using a compatible? And select the media option that you're actually wanting to print on. Now, we've also compiled a complete profile list of all the Permajet papers in one downloadable zip file, which will then need to be unzipped or extracted. And by doing that, you actually click File and Extract All. You can save them in a folder on your desktop. And when you're using that particular paper type, you can install them as required. Now, to make a printer profile, we must first output what we call a test patch. And this is where a lot of people get confused. And this is to see what colors the printer will actually produce. The colors produced by this chart is then read by our calibration device. And it makes a comparison between the colors it sends to the printer and the data it receives from the printed chart via the optical reading device. Can I make my own profiles? I get asked quite a lot. And the answer is yes, you can. If you use the Color Monkey photo, which prices start from about 300 pounds, uh, yeah, 300 pounds this only matches about 50 color um, spaces or patches on the actual um, form. So when you're actually printing it off, it won't give you as much color information as you need to give you that lovely quality. Our custom ICC profiles have over a thousand color patches, and that's using what we call an X-Rite ISIS device. And all our Permajet uh, papers, as long as you're printing on Permajet, it's a free service. Now, custom ICC profiles are important for anyone wanting to print 100% color correct images while avoiding the hassle of guesswork and wasted time, paper and ink. And it's free of any of our papers. To create a custom profile, you'll need to uh, print a Permajet profiling chart through what we call the Adobe Color Print Utility, both of which are provided from the link shown below with full instructions and video instructions for you to follow from our website. And I've put the link there for you to actually follow. So let's follow the procedure. Now, just to explain a little bit, the Adobe Color Printer Utility was actually um, brought into creation, if you like, because um, Adobe actually, after CS4, took off the option of no color management from the options on the color handling side. Now, in order to actually run a target patch, you have to turn the color management off. So Adobe were forced into actually producing some software, which they call the Adobe Color Printer Utility, which actually has done that all for you on the color handling side. So you have to run this um, software first before you actually print the patch out. From our website, you'll go into the custom ICC profile and you'll see the custom profiling pack. Now this contains the Permajet profiling instructions, the Adobe Color Printer utility for Windows or Mac, and it also includes our target patch. This is the target patch, and this is a typical patch here, and this is what you actually print out. So how do I use it? Make sure your printer has no blocked heads by carrying out a basic nozzle pattern. Install the relevant Adobe Color Printer utility for a Mac or a PC, and then open it. 
You then run the ACPU application and a window will open asking you to open a TIFF file. This is the profiling chart in step four of the download, which is the target patch. The file is formatted for an A4 size sheet. So if you're using a larger paper, such as an A3 or A3 plus, <clears throat> or a roll media, please don't enlarge the file as you must print it out exactly as it comes out on an A4 100%, no scaling or resizing. You must not crop it, enlarge it or reduce the size or this will actually cause it to fail. You can print the A4 patch out onto an A4 sheet if you want, onto it, sorry, onto an A3 sheet and then just cut round it and send it in to us or cut the A3 paper down in half and then you'll be able to run it. Now, things to look out for, when you're actually downloading the Adobe Color Printer utility on a Mac, it is slightly different. On a PC, it's very straightforward. You actually download the Adobe Color Printer utility and you can run the software and it opens up quite normally and you just follow the instructions as it comes through. On a Mac though, it is slightly different. First off, when you go into your system preferences and go into security and privacy settings, sometimes when you're actually trying to download anything from um, Google that Mac don't know about, they will block it. And you have to unlock your padlock on your um, actual system preferences securities. Then you can download it, but you will still not be able to open it. And this is what you see. Just behind the Adobe Color Printer gray screen, you'll actually see the Adobe Printer utility on the left-hand side. And you come up with this warning. It can't open the file because the developer can't be verified. So all you do is you go to back to your security and privacy, and there you'll actually see, you'll see the padlock in the bottom left-hand corner there. But because we've downloaded the software already, it's actually saying right at the bottom there, Adobe Color Printer Utility was blocked from use because it is not an identified developer. You click open anyway, and this then will give you another option to open the software. So you click open. This takes it to a list actually in the actual folder on your desktop, and therefore you open it up and there's the target patch. And you just click open at the bottom of your page. It all sounds very complicated, but it's very straightforward. After you've actually run the software, you select the print setup. Make sure that the paper size is set to A4. Ensure that a borderless option is not selected, as this may scale the print and resize it. Then click OK and go to print. Now we have to set the printer options. We have to set the media and paper type. Now that each paper has its own unique paper media option. For example, if you're actually using the Oyster paper, then it becomes on the Canon or on the um, Epsom, sorry, is the actual Epsom semi-gloss paper. But on a Canon, it'll come out as um, photo paper semi-luster. So we need to know the, the different options for each paper type. Now this setting is virtually, sorry, is vitally important because it governs the amount of ink that is used and which is laid down on the paper. Incorrect media type settings can cause issues such as the pooling of ink on the uh, paper, fuzziness, and a lack of uh, differentiation in shadows and dark colors. Now, once you've actually chosen the media option, we then actually create the profile using your media option that you've actually selected. So therefore, it's quite important that you actually are consistent throughout. So once this is created, the profile will only be accurate for the setting that you select. So it's important to select the right one. <clears throat> now, we have selected a uh, option media type paper chart, which actually gives you the media options for all our permajet paper. So you don't have to think, well, what do I use? And you won't be confused. This can be found as downloadable actually on our website. Alternatively, in every box of paper that you actually buy, the sheet's actually enclosed in the box. So you'll actually see there, for example, on Epsom printers, Epsom models using up to six inks, Alpha, 
the media option will be Epsom Archival Matte, or if you're using seven colors or more, you choose Velvet Fine Art Paper, etc. Disable printed driver color management is the next thing. And print and check the profiling chart. Once you've selected your printer driver settings, make sure you correctly load a sheet of paper that you want to profile, coated side facing up, and then click print. And if you're not sure which is the coated side, you can test this by licking your thumb and forefinger and just pinching the corner of the sheet. The coated side will always stick to the finger. Now, disabling the color management on an Epsom, for example, you'll actually see there the media type option there that you actually, that's where you actually select your options on what paper choice to actually choose. You select your mode to custom and you'll actually see that you have options there to turn off the color adjustment. So that's where you need to, to turn it off on the printer side. Actually on a Canon, slightly different, you can actually see the media type option in the main part there, Photo Paper Pro Platinum. Then you'll actually see the color intensity handling, choose manual. And then you have the option to turn off the color management. So that none must be applied. Now on a Mac, you don't have to worry. The color management is turned off for you. So you don't have to worry about finding the setting for that. Now, we've nearly finished. Now, once the target patch has been printed on the paper type you want profiled, you complete the order form, which is found in the profiling instructions. Send this in to, the, in to us with the patch using a large letter stamp, and then we'll create a bespoke profile for you, which we will email to you and then install. On the same day that we receive your patch in the post, we'll send it to you. So the quicker you can send it in to us, the sooner we can actually get your profile out to you. <clears throat> we have actually got YouTube videos to actually help you on the Adobe Color Print Utility and printing the target patch. We have videos for the Windows and we also actually run them on the Mac as well to help you. Now, setting up your software correctly, before installing the new profiles, let's check your Photoshop default settings first. And we would actually recommend that you actually um, set your actual workspace to Adobe RGB 1998. Now, some people actually say, well, I've got mine set as sRGB, which is fine. Try and match them to the same settings that you've actually got your camera set up as. When you're actually printing, Adobe RGB gives you more color space, which is why we always recommend it. sRGB is predominantly used when you're actually converting your image down to use on a PDI presentation or using for competitions through uh, projected digital image files. So actually compresses, it's a small unit and it's not such a big file. Adobe RGB will give you the most color space that you should use when actually printing a print out. So that's why we always advise that you actually choose that option. We always suggest on the actual color handling side that you actually choose perceptual intent for the rendering intent as well. Black point compensation should be ticked as this retains the blackest point from the source file. Now, if you actually go up to the system preferences <clears throat> and then you'll actually see color settings and there you'll be able to set your actual working space. The RGB space, it's a drop down box there where it says Adobe RGB. If you drop that space down or that file down, you'll be able to see a whole list of different options. When you actually get the profile back from us, and indeed when you actually see the generic profile, this is how we name them. Now we always start all our profiles by naming them APJ. A is obviously the first letter of the alphabet and PJ stands for Permajet. That means when you actually select your profile, which I'm going to show you where you actually select it from, um, they will always appear at the top of your list. So it actually makes it a lot easier to find. We always actually put the name of the person who's sending in the profile. We always then give you the ink type that you're using. So OEM is the manufacturer's ink type. 
we put the model of the printer in there as well. We also tell you whether you've used black, photo black ink or matte black ink. Obviously, the media type is most important. So whether it's oyster or gloss or ultra pearl or anything like that, we always put the name of the paper in there. And then we actually put the media setting in as Epsom Premium Glossy. This then is the file that's actually sent to you. And then you can actually refer to it because you can check if you can't remember exactly what media setting that you actually ran the profile target patch with and then you can actually assign it to the actual photograph that you actually want to print. I'm going to send a similar example down below as well, just changing the ink type down to matte black ink and media type is portrait white, but this time we've actually used watercolor radiant white as the media setting. So it really is important to actually be consistent with your workflow. How to install your new ICC profile. <clears throat> To install a profile on a PC, it actually lives in C Drive, Windows, System32, Spool, Drivers, and then Color. Now this then will actually sit there quite happily and, uh, and then I'll show you where to download it. Now you can also, on a PC only, if you actually save the profile to your desktop, if you actually click on the profile, don't open it, highlight it, right click with the mouse, and then it'll say install profile. And that's a quicker way to actually install it onto your system. To Mac, it's a little bit different. You have to actually make sure that you've actually got the Macintosh hard drive ticked as open. And I'll show you that in a moment. Library, color sync and profiles. So again, save the profiles from our email onto the desktop on the Mac, and then you can actually drag them into that profile folder once you actually opened it. Now where to find the Macintosh hard drive? You click on the Apple symbol on a Mac, you then go to Finder, Preferences, click the General tab, and then you'll see a whole list of options, and one of them will be the hard drive. You tick it and a little gray box on the right hand side of your desktop will appear. And that's the actual Macintosh hard drive. Now how to use your new ICC profile. When you're actually going into Photoshop and you're actually, you have to assign your color handling. Let Photoshop manage these colors. This means that you are taking full control of the color space and the profile and you want that full control to actually happen in order to print your work. If you actually choose printer determines the color at that option, everything else will be grayed out and you won't be able to actually assign any kind of profile. So always choose, let Photoshop manages the colors. The printer profile right underneath that box is the profile box. And if you drop it down, there'll be a tremendous amount of profiles which will be predominantly either the Canon profiles, if you've got a Canon printer, or the Epson profiles. If you go down that list, you'll actually see the actual Permajet profile, and it will begin with APJ. And you can see there that we've actually got there a generic profile as it's OEM for the 2880, use photo black ink, and it's Oyster Epson Premium Glossy. So we know that at any one time, we know that we've actually got a set uh, media type as Epson Premium Glossy in order to match the profile that's been created. Rendering intent should be perceptual and black point compensation should be ticked. You can use relative color metric, of course, there is that option, but it depends on the actual um, piece of work that you're actually printing. Depends what colors you're actually working with. What are the darker areas? What are the lighter areas in your image? And that'll actually determine whether you use perceptual or relative color metric. If in doubt, print two images out using either or, and then just use the, the best one that's suitable for you. Now, technical support with regards to any of the profiling and uh, downloading the profile patches we're always here. We've got a dedicated team to support you. 
Um, we're all photographically trained and we have been in the industry for many years. So we're here to help you because at the end of the day, we want you to actually be able to actually get your color space and calibration right, profiling your papers correct. So therefore what you've taken on your camera, you can actually process through your workflow and actually have the confidence to actually print your image out. And then it should actually match what you're viewing on the screen. So once as we say is you've got all the ducks in a row, then you'll be happy and then you'll be printing left, right and center, which is always good for everybody. Now, become a SheClicks member for free. Those people who are watching on Facebook, um, the, the, as the UK photographic industry is always keen to support SheClick members, you'll be able to get various discounts. These are exclusive to members only. So become a member. You'll certainly find there's a lot of benefits on there and you'll find it very worthwhile. As Permajet, we are very proud to actually say that we've been able to offer a 20% on discount off Permajet Media for you. And this is off our sheet or roll media for all SheClick members only. If you've missed our last webinar on choosing the right paper for your images, Permajet have created the Knowledge Volume 1. With the knowledge, you'll gain the confidence to choose the right paper that's just right for you and your images. And you can download this from the SheClicks members area. Now, as the SheClicks, we've actually offering a special Permajet paper sample pack. Now, this pack actually includes various Permajet media types. Now, this is $6.95, and that's a delivered cost. And that'll be literally, if you telephone our office, we can't unfortunately put it on the website because everybody will be able to purchase it. And this is a special deal for SheClick members only. So please call us and then just quote the SheClick sample pack and that code, and we'll be able to process it for you. Why not keep in touch with us? Now we have social channels and we're always active on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Permajet. So if you've got any questions at all, regardless of what it's about, obviously to do with paper or photography or profiling, <laughs> not the weather, and, um, and then just contact us because we always would love to hear from you. Now, all that remains for me to say is thank you for attending this webinar this evening. Now I have covered quite a bit tonight, and I know that some of you are going to be uh, quite boggled and it is a lot to take on board. But we do have written instructions on calibrating and profiling, and it takes you through literally step by step of the actual procedure. They're easy to follow. We actually do videos, which you can actually watch as well, which again will take you through step by step, so you can pause them as you're going through it. If you have a problem, we're more than happy to actually talk you through it. We're more than happy to actually log on to your computer and actually help you through it. So once you know the procedure and the actual um, procedure on how to actually run it, then you'll be able to do it the next time. But once all your docs are in the row, you'll be able to go away and be confident that you will get good results and fantastic images. Thank you for attending tonight. Please keep safe and well. Thank you. That was great. Thanks very much, Louise. So we have a few questions. Um, OK, far away. So let me just scroll this up. OK, so Vanessa says, how bright is 100 candela? How bright? It actually just takes you down. It's, it's bright, but it's not really low because what a calibration device will do is actually measure the brightness that's actually on your screen. And it will actually um, assign a level that will actually say that is calibrating your device. Now, sometimes when you actually have um, profiled or calibrated your monitor and you actually print an image out, the actual image may still come out quite dark. Mm. Now, your screen will be showing quite bright, but the printer itself will print out quite dark. Now, that means this happens particularly on a Mac. And what we find is that the brightness level that's been assigned after you calibrated your monitor is set too high. So if you just reduce the brightness level slightly, you can actually get it to match what comes out of the printer because it's actually the printer that's telling you the truth. 
Nine times out of 10, you can also assign an action on your Photoshop or Lightroom. And this, after you've manipulated your image, it'll just actually assign a layer on to lighten up your image, which will actually give you the desired result on the output that comes out onto the printer. But it's quite a, a classic um, symptom of calibration. <clears throat> okay. So uh, there's your answer, Vanessa. Uh, Luis says, so if you calibrate one evening, should you recalibrate if you process in daylight? Yes, you should always calibrate round about the same time of day that you tend to actually work on your images. So if you're a morning person and you find that obviously the light is certainly a lot brighter and then you should calibrate in the morning. Uh, but however, if you're working throughout the day, perhaps, and you don't get to actually process your images until the evening, I'm a prime culprit for that. I tend to actually work with my images about 11 o'clock at night. And so it's pitch black, so the curtains all around, uh, but I prefer to actually work like that. And so I've calibrated my monitor um, in that sur those surrounds. And then I can make sure that what you see is actually what you actually get coming out of the printer. Okay, the um, data color spider that you mentioned, that does actually yeah. have a, um, an ambient light measure on it, doesn't it? And actually, it, it's quite interesting how low it wants the light to be. So yes. if you can calibrate in sort of gloomy conditions, that's good. Mm -hmm. But also, I think you can get, you can give each calibration a name. So you should, I think, be able to switch between different ones rather than having to go through the process. You the can. Morning and then the next day. Yes, you can. You can actually save them and just assign the profile, the relevant uh, profile that you actually want to use. You can also go back as well because it actually lists down every time you actually calibrate, it'll list the actual date that you've actually um, assigned it. So yeah. it does give you the option to actually save it and name it. So you can save it as the date um, and then you can actually switch back to whichever you want. But you can do two calibrations, yes, one for morning and one for evening. Bear in mind though, as, as you mentioned before, you need to recalibrate on a regular basis and you can set the frequency of that. So I think mine's set to remind me every month that I should yes. recalibrate. Yeah, it's, it's wise every month because it's amazing what can actually uh, just kick it out. So and it just makes sure. One of the things that I find is that I personally, I actually cover my monitor when I'm not using it. So I've got an actual piece of uh, curtain cloth actually material and I actually cover it when I'm not using it. Because if you've actually got it in an open office and you've got natural daylight coming in, this can actually affect the actual monitor. So it won't actually last quite so long. So therefore the actual, um, the actual viewing screen will change. And that's why you need to calibrate regularly. By covering it over with a cloth, that actually just protects it and makes it more consistent. Okay. Um, Esther has said, what are your views on the spider cube as a calibrator and um i don't know if you're aware of that louise it's 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 not actually um a monitor calibrator or a printer calibrator it's actually for calibrating your images really it's something you include in your shot and then it helps you set the white point and the black point That's so it right. doesn't adjust your monitor it's it's more for your no, images right. and your raw files so Esther, I think it's a long time since i use one and i think it does have its uses but it's not really the purpose of not you know, for calibrating your monitor, no, no. no. We have got quite a few, actually. <laughs> They're quite old. They've been around a long time. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, I guess, I mean, one of them is, I remember, it's, I think it's a dark, there's a black hole, isn't there? And that's so you can that's get a right. proper black and, yeah. Mm. Okay. They are quite useful. It's quite interesting to, to use and try out, to be fair. So yeah. out in the field. Um, but it's not really part of your workflow process in connection with calibration and profiling. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, Cecilia said, it's more of a comment really, but will I ever get the hang of this, I wonder? I find it daunting, but we'll watch this video over and over until it sinks in. Um, yeah, I think it, is, it is daunting. <laughs> it does seem that way. And I think yeah. it's also one of these things where if you just watch the video and then you watch it again, it might not make a, a great deal of difference. You kind of need to go through the process and hmm do it step by step because it does become yes. more logical because obviously when you're looking at the screen they oh, okay i do that so maybe mm -hmm. watch it while you're doing going through the process or something that might exactly help. i mean what uh, what i always say to actually people which is why we've actually written the instructions out because you can actually print them off and have it by the side of you and literally just go through every step it is logical 
but you just have to follow um, a procedure and, and the way forward will actually take you to the end degree. It is daunting, uh, I won't lie, we do get customers who are thoroughly confused, um, but it is easy once you actually get um, the system going and everything in progress. If you're doing it regularly, it's easier. But if you're doing it every once in a while, you do tend to actually forget. Hence the videos were created and the actual written instructions for you to follow. But we are always here to actually help you and talk you through it. Great, thank you. And of course, once you've gone through the process, you know, you'll see huge benefits and that kind of makes you feel better about doing it. <laughs> well, it will, because at the end of the day, a lot of people actually complain about, well, my prints don't match what I actually uh, see on my monitor. And the first question we, we ask them is, well, do you actually calibrate your monitor device? And they go, well, no, I've never used um, anything like that at all. Yeah, because everything you start fine. explaining it. <laughs> well, no, well, we ask them, do you, have you ever used profiles? And uh, you'll get the comment back, well, I don't know what a profile is. So it's all part of education and actually understanding the relationship between the colors. And that's the most important thing. And once you've actually taken that on board and you actually see the end results, you'll be absolutely gobsmacked and actually be able to print perfect prints that you'll be proud of. And of course, you'll waste a lot less paper. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> a lot less frustrating. But nobody wants to waste paper. So uh, that's why I always uh, recommend that printing a nozzle check first before you actually print anything, even yeah. if you're not, we're not talking about profiling here, just generally before you actually start to print, make it part of your actual workflow just run a nozzle check. It takes just a few seconds, stick a piece of plain paper in and just print a nozzle check from your maintenance area on your printer and make sure all the lines are in the right place. And then as long as they are there, you'll be fine. If you see any gaps, then you'll need to do some nozzle checks. And then once they're all checked again, that's fine. You can carry on printing. Right. Okay. Uh, Chrissy says, brilliant webinar. Thank you. Uh, how do you load a custom profile into Lightroom though? Onto Lightroom, onto slightly different. Uh, with Photoshop, it appears automatically in the list of profiles, but on Lightroom, you have to actually add it. So once you actually go into Lightroom, you can assign your actual color handling, which will be let Photoshop determine the colors. And then you'll actually see right under there that there'll be a plus symbol. And that's got a little profile you just click on that box and it'll open up your all the profiles for your computer. Don't delete anything I would hasten to add because this is all the profiles for your computer on there. But you will see all the actual paper permajet profiles that you've actually saved in there. If you highlight it and add it, it'll add it to the list of profiles that you've already got saved, if you've got some saved on there. And then every time you then use that paper, from Lightroom, it'll actually appear in that list already. So it's very easy to select. Great. And it, presumably you've got the details all written out. Yep. On the website. Yep. For that as well. Okay. We have. Now, Pam says, uh, what is the Sheclix code for the sample pack? And you know what? I can't remember off the top of my head, but Pam, if you go to the website, go to the uh, She Benefits section, there's a whole list of uh, codes and discounts and stuff, but it's there. And there's also a link. To, the, to download the knowledge as well. Right, Ambi says, my monitor is not an HD monitor. We bought it about seven years back. Uh, is it possible to calibrate my monitor or is it advisable to buy a new monitor with HD and calibrate no. it? No, you can calibrate your monitor. It's not a problem. As long as obviously the um, it's still working consistently for you and that the colors are correct. Um, monitors will deteriorate with age. So the older the actual monitor, it will start to lose its uh, resolution. And that's really what you've got to look for. Um, if you actually start to see that the colors are definitely not coming out correctly actually on your actual uh, image, um, then it might be that you're actually working space, the monitor is starting to fail and therefore you're not actually seeing the colors correctly. Why we actually calibrate a monitor is that and your eyes can be so easily fooled is that it's just like going in from a dark room into bright sunshine or vice versa. Your eyes take a little bit of time to actually adjust to actually viewing. So if you're actually choosing to work in your front of your monitor in the morning, for example, or at night, your eyes will take time to actually get used to the actual viewing screen. 
they will adjust to what your screen is actually showing. It's not the other way around. So you can be manipulating your images and you might be doing it incorrectly. You might be altering the hue and saturation incorrectly on your image. And therefore you're, you're on a hopeless line to trying to get your image correct on the output. So really for a printer of that age, um, seven years old, as long as it's actually been protected from the bright sunshine, then it should be okay but calibrate it and see. And if you're still not getting the desired results, then you might want to consider purchasing and having a look at a new printer. With the uh, photography show coming up, hopefully, which we were speaking about earlier on, whether it'll be an actual physical show or an actual um, virtual show, there will be special offers on monitors there. So uh, I'm sure you'll be able to pick one at a really good rate for you. And bear in mind, if you buy a calibrator, if you find that your uh, current monitor isn't, you know, isn't up to it and you buy a new monitor, you'll still get benefit from your calibrator. So you will indeed. Another thing to actually consider as well is the actual if you actually buy a calibration device now, um, it might not be compatible to your monitor because technology has uh, improved. Uh, Windows 10 has come out and thrown a lot of spanners in a lot of works there. Um, so there might ne not necessarily be a driver for it. Right. So it might be just worth just checking on the x right website uh, for if you're looking at the spiders and actually just have a little um, look to see whether there is a driver for your actual monitor, because you just need to make sure that it's compatible. It might be that you might not be able to get a calibration device that's suitable to work with your monitor, in which case you might have to buy a new monitor. Oh, OK. Um, Donna says, oh, or asks, sorry, does Permajet have the same type of service in the US? Um, we have agents in the United States, um, but not quite the service, no, that we actually offer here in Permajet. Um, we are always here by email, so we can as, just as well log on to your machine in the States as opposed to um, here. So we're always happy to help you. So just drop us an email and we will always respond back. Great, thank you very much for that. Uh, Trace is asking if there's any monitors that you would recommend. The, um, depends on your budget, really. Um, the ISOs are at the top end of the market and they are exceptional qualities. Um, you can actually spend from round about seven, 800 pounds for a starting price up to two, 3,000. Um, so they are the more expensive monitors. BenQ monitors are really good monitors. I've got a BenQ monitor myself, uh, which is a, um, a 32 inch. And I've actually got the actual size that fit onto the monitor. So you've actually got like a cushion hood around it. And that is actually quite perfect because it actually, just as you're looking at a print, if those of you who watched my last presentation, when you're actually looking at a print, you want to view straight through to the actual screen. You don't want your eyes to be pulled away either side of the monitor. So if you've got things happening on the shelf or the clock ticking or kettle boiling or anything like that, these screens just actually shield it and direct your eyes straight through. And they are really fantastic. So I do recommend them. And the BenQ monitor is very stable and very reliable. So I would re certainly recommend the BenQs as well as the um, ISOs. Great, thank you. Um, you've actually inadvertently answered Lorraine's question because she was saying, would a hood around the monitor help? So, yeah, most uh, definitely. Yes, great. Um, excuse me, sorry. Penny says she uses an Epsom 3000. Swapping the blacks between papers is a pain and wastes so much ink. Is there mm -hmm. a workaround? There is a workaround, yes. Um, we would always recommend um, that using art papers, which is when you need to actually change over the ink from photo black ink to the matte black ink. Um, if your work is actually really punchy and you want lots of contrast and color, then regretfully you should change over to the matte black ink. It's not quite so bad when you're changing the ink from photo black to matte black, but it's when you change back from matte black to photo black is when it starts really churning and using the ink up. If, however, your images are quite um, pale and arty or artistic or high key, then you can get away with using the photo black ink. You, you set the actual media selection when you're running the target patch off as Epsom Premium Glossy or Epsom Archival Matte, 
and then actually just print the target patch off using the photo black ink, marking on your sheet that you've used photo black ink, and we will then save your profile as photo black ink. And you can consistently then use that profile for um, your matte papers, but still using the photo black ink. You won't get a, as good a quality, as I said, depends on your images. Um, it, it is a pain to be fair on the 3000s, um, but, um, but obviously with the newer models, you don't have that um, problem. It's actually all, uh, all done for you. So you don't have that issue. Um, but I can understand it, it is a problem, but we do recommend that you change over to the mat. But as I said, you can still use the photo black if you wish. Dallas has said, do you have to use Photoshop or Lightroom for this profiling? She's thinking of getting another processing software to avoid uh, the monthly subscription. <laughs> and that's not by affinity by any chance, is it? <laughs> um, yes, um, you can actually use um, affinity if you're actually looking at the affinity photo. Um, we are actually um, about to um, do a course actually on affinity um, to actually run that process and show you how to do it because it's slightly different, but yes, you can. That's not an issue. Right. So what, basically, whichever software you're thinking of using, just check that uh, it enables uh, you to use profiles and you should be fine. Correct. It will be yes. listed somewhere because it is a, a benefit. You know, the, so the it link is a benefit, to... yes. Affinity, it is a bit hidden, I have to say, in Affinity, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but it is there. So that's why we're actually going to um, you know, talk yeah. about it um, as it is important. There's, there is a cost involved in CC, as we all know, um, which is round about £8.70 or 80 isn't it, per month now. Um, and Affinity Photo is a one-off. Um, the editing software on it is really good. And I have to say, most people that I've spoken to actually use Affinity. They will actually process the images on it, but they'll still print it through Photoshop because they've got an old Photoshop, not CC. Right. Yeah. So there is that option. It's really cheating, yeah. but it is yeah. that option. Um, I'm a Photoshop user and have been all my life. So I'm just lazy. I don't want to change. It works for me yeah. and I process that way, but I will be having a look at Affinity because I'm quite intrigued as to what it has to offer. Yeah, it is. It is very good. I've used it, uh, you know, I've tested it quite a bit and I believe they've got an offer on at the moment where you could get three months trial. Uh, was it 90 days, which about, you know, is three months I think it's, um, yes, and yes. it's half price. So, you know, it's a good time to be looking at it. Thank you for telling me that. I will log on because I always <laughs> miss it. <laughs> um, Marina says, is it right uh, to have an automatic adjust of the brightness when you when the light changes? So I think that's on your monitor, isn't it? You can yes. it, so it will adjust the brightness of it. Well, you can, yes. But ideally, it depends on where your monitor is situated in your room. Don't sit, put it in front of a window because you shouldn't need to actually alter the brightness level of your monitor. It should be constant. We always recommend ideally that you actually work from um, a desktop printer or monitor rather, um, because if you're working from a laptop, no matter where you actually open the laptop to, when you actually move the screen backwards and forwards, you can actually see that the colors will change. Mm. So it's not consistent. Now, if you start altering the brightness level actually on your screen, you're never gonna have it consistent. So the whole idea of calibrating your monitor is to actually work in a consistent workflow. Once that's actually calibrated, that is the workspace that your eyes should actually be working with. And that's really what you should concentrate on. So with the laptops, I'm not suggesting that you can't um, work on a laptop, you can. But uh, one of the tricks one of my customers actually uh, told me the other day is he's got a piece of string and he actually measures it. So from when he opens up the laptop, he'll put the piece of string at the top of the, on the right hand corner and down to the bottom of the laptop. And once that's taught, he knows that that angle is perfect for his viewing. And he's calibrated his monitor that way. And he says it's absolutely perfect. So it's a good tip, very yeah, cheap method of actually I've never, would never have thought of it, but it really worked. Of course, we all need to know how long is his piece of string? <laughs> ah, <laughs> good question. Uh, Chrissy's got another question. Uh, I have a, she has an x rite device that she uses to calibrate her screen, but it doesn't calibrate her printer. Does her printer need calibrating? Do I need another device? Thank you. 
Yeah, well, the actual printer is the actual, you are profiling the papers to actually work with the printer. So it's not actually per se the printer, but you have to print the target patch out using your printer. That's how you get a custom profile. So it's not actually the printer profile. So you, but you, you don't need to get another device if you use Permajet paper no. because you can send no. the print. Send them into us. So yeah. you, you can either download, uh, you can download a generic profile. So the generic profiles we've actually created here at Permajet. Now this is going well back. You know, some of them are about eight years old, nine years old on printers. So you know, we've got the 1400s down there and the 1500s right from the beginning of Epson almost. Um, so you can actually um, just look for your actual printer type on the actual options that I showed you and uh, select your printer type and then select what ink you're using. So are you using the manufacturer's cartridges um, or are you using compatible cartridges? Then you actually select the paper type that you want to use, whether it's Oyster or Gloss, and then you'll be able to actually uh, download the profile. Once you've downloaded it, don't open it save it onto your desktop and then if you're on a pc you can either right click and install or go through the c drive and the windows option and on a mac make sure your macintosh hard drive is open and then save it in the library color sync and profile folder and then off you go okay uh sandra says should the printing companies be able to supply profiles for their paper and printer so you mean the printer manufacturers um they mm. they do they do <clears throat> they do they yes. tend to be generic but ones they are they will be generic yeah. um so um generic profiles are literally what they say they are they are generic now every printer type uh, or every batch of printers that's created by a manufacturer the color gamuts will slightly change now, if, for example, Angela's got um, a 2400, which is a, one of the older 20, um, Epson printers, and I've got a 2400, and Angela gets a profile downloaded or even a bespoke profile for Oyster paper, exactly the same paper, exactly the same ink, and the same printer. Now, I could say to Angela, well, you've just had that profile done, so save me running off the target patch because it is a bit confusing. Can you send me your profile? That profile won't necessarily work on your machine because it depends when your printer was actually manufactured, the color gamuts may have changed slightly and that'll alter the actual color that's being outputted. So therefore you have to actually run the target patch off on your machine, send it into us, and then we will create you a bespoke profile, which is purely for your printer alone and nobody else's. And then you'll make sure that you can actually print and get the desired result. So generic profiles don't always work because it's impossible for us to actually keep up to date with all the manufacturers, printers that are actually available and are produced. So hence, we always say, start with a generic profile. You might be quite happy using the generic profiles, which is fantastic. And then you won't have to go down the line of running a target patch off. But if you, you're not quite happy with the colours or you see that the actual colours, if you're getting perhaps a magenta cast, then that is a dead sign really that your profile is not working quite correctly for you and that it's not reading the colours correctly. So therefore you have to download the target patch. Okay, um, Laura's asking a question that kind of relates to your previous webinar, which is what are your favourite papers and why? <laughs> Right. Now, uh, personally wise, uh, my genre of photography is really uh, nature, sport, portrait and fine art. Now, I really like the fibre based family. And the reason why I choose the fibre based family is that I used to be a darkroom worker. So I used to actually process my images in the darkroom. And therefore, I was using the fiber based papers, which gives you really good depth and particularly on monochrome, it gives you really good um, mono detail as well and shadow detail. So I've really grown up with the fiber based family and the fiber based Barata range of papers actually relate to the darkroom style. So it actually gives you that really good depth and really sumptuous quality, which is so uh, classical of, a, of a, a darkroom paper. So that's why I use the fiber-based family. 
I used to also use the smooth, the photo art silk now. It used to be smooth art silk, but it's called photo art silk. And that's in our smooth fine art range, which can be found in test pack three. And that is extremely good. I do a lot of um, um, portrait work. I go around all Blackpool punks up at Blackpool, which is held every year. I go up to the Whitby Goths and, and all these kind of events. I go to reenactment events. I am actually a member of a camera club and I also lecture. So I then go around and take lots of images. And the photo art silk actually gives you a really lovely feeling and graduation of color. If you've got a lovely texture and feel of the actual um, person's clothing that they're wearing and it works and performs really well. It's also really good for landscape work as well. If you've got lots of graduation of color or doing slow water shutter speed shots. It's a yeah. superb paper for that as well. So those really are the, the two areas and the two families that I would choose personally for my work. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Um, Pauline's got an interesting question. She says she's not used her Canon Pro 1 printer for about six months. Is there anything she should look out for when she goes to print again? She's not used it due to the prints always coming out dark, but now she understands why. OK, well, the first off where before, if you haven't been using your printer for a while, is to run a nozzle check. And that is the first thing to do. Um, if it hasn't been used for about six months, you might find that some of the colors have dropped out and the inks might have dried up, particularly if it's actually in a, a room that's actually got central heating in the area as well. So the inks might have actually just caked up and solidified a little bit in the head. So if you actually run the nozzle check and you've actually got gaps in the actual um, blocks, then that's an indication that you will need to do some head cleans and you actually run a head clean. So run the nozzle check first and then do a head clean, run a nozzle check and then just keep checking backwards and forwards until you actually see that the colors are starting to come through. Usually every third clean is a power clean and that actually gives it a good old clean out and gives it a, a little bit of an extra push. You might have to do about three blocks of those to actually start getting the colors moving, but they will start to come through. Believe me, it might take a little while, but they will start yeah. to actually come through. For anyone who's not sure what the cleaning cycle is, it's, you don't actually get a, a sponge and rub it down or anything like that. It's actually <laughs> just a, a process that you tell, the, you tell the printer to go through. So you yeah. might need to check your manual and it will show tell you which buttons to press and how to get it to run. Yeah, it'll be in your maintenance screen, um, usually on the same screen that you're actually assigning um, the media options, if you remember where that was, on your page setup, you can actually, you'll see some tabs across the top, and one of them will be utilities or maintenance, and you go into that actual tag, and that'll actually be listed down as one of the options. Your print head alignment will also be there as well. Okay, so good luck with that, Pauline. Uh, Penny says, uh, she with the test packs, are the papers marked on the back now? Because she's got quite a few anonymous art papers from various test packs. Okay. They're not marked on the back, uh, no, but included in every test pack is an A7 swatch. So if you actually, they are put in order in the actual box, but that's, I know how easy that is to actually mix them up. So, but you can refer to them on the surface type, make sure that you're actually looking at the printed side. So just actually touch the corner, lick your finger and just touch the corner. And if it's sticky, then that is the side to actually compare it with the A7 swatch. The A7 swatch is actually designed and worked in families. So you can actually go either the digital photo range or the fiber base range or the smooth art or the textured. And you can just actually then match up the actual surface type that you're looking at from the test pack against the actual A7 swatch and you'll be able to see which paper type it is. Okay so and I guess if you, when you first open it and they're all in, in order before they you are. shuffle them you could very carefully just Mark like back. write on yeah okay. Yes yes you could. Uh, Tracy said that volume one of the knowledge gives lots of great info on papers so. Good. Yes. Make sure you download it, everybody. It's worthwhile. Pauline says, thank you very much. Um, now, Lorraine's got an interesting question. ISO, the monitor company, has produced, uh, sorry, has worked with Canon and Epson to produce a calibration program, which you, which you download for whichever of the two print, sorry, for whichever printer you're using, and um, you don't have to use any other calibrator. 
So sorry, that wasn't yeah, you can, Yeah, some monitors actually have a calibration built in. Mm -hmm. um, the BenQ for one does, certainly does, and the ISOs do as well. Um, you don't have to calibrate yourself. As long as what you're actually viewing on the screen is actually what is coming out of the printer, then you can be rest assured that you're, what you're seeing is actually true. And so you'll be fine. You won't have to actually calibrate. I do actually just keep it in check because I actually want consistency. Because nine times out of 10, when I actually go and turn my uh, monitor and um, printer on, I want to actually manipulate my images quite quickly because I'm doing it for lecturing purposes. So I want to actually rest assured that what I'm seeing, I don't want to think, oh God, that's not right. I'll, I need to calibrate. I need consistency. So I do it just for the consistent um, approach there. So once you can actually be assured that the color space is correctly, and you're actually outputting the desired result, then that's absolutely fine. Yep. They are very consistent. Okay, well, congratulations. You've reached the end of the questions. And uh, <laughs> lots of people saying, thank you very much. They've, some have found it mind boggling, but they are inspired to give it a go. So thank you very much for that. I think that's great. It's a great pleasure. Well, it is rewarding. So please give it a go, but I am always here to actually help you help you through it and, uh, and ease the pain. And I can then talk you through it. And then you'll think, oh God, that's how you do it. That's it, so yes. It's not that confusing. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Have a good evening. And to you, Angela, nice to see you all. Bye. Goodbye.